It's Mazda Sports Look. Where you see the brightest stars. The leading personalities. The headliners and cover stories of the sports world. On Sports Look, the issues get analyzed. And the questions get answered. The host of Sports Look is Roy Firestone, award-winning journalist and interviewer. Supported by an expert cast of sports authorities. Sports Look is brought to you by Mazda and its new generation RX-7. The world-class 626, the fun-to-drive 323, and the full line of Mazda trucks. The more you look, the more you like Mazda value. Now here's your Sports Look host, Roy Firestone. Well, this has become something of a salute to the Cardinals week on Sports Look. Tuesday, a Cardinal star of the future, perhaps, pitcher Joe McGrain. Yesterday, a Cardinal star of the present, Ozzie Smith. And today, the greatest Cardinal pitcher who ever lived. Indeed, a megastar of the past. Stardom didn't come easily for Bob Gibson. He grew up in an Omaha, Nebraska ghetto, a sickly child. He was afflicted with asthma, rickets. He learned to survive by battling. He became an athlete on sheer will. Now, he could have boxed professionally, they say. He was a wonderful basketball player who played briefly with the Harlem Globetrotters, but baseball was his game. When one thinks of Bob Gibson, you don't think merely of his six all-star appearances, his two Cy Young Awards, his selection as MVP both in the World Series and the regular season. You think of iron will. He came to the ballpark, all business. He pitched, they say, angry. Of his 17 strikeout performance against the Tigers in the 1968 World Series, the former teammate Mike Shannon told me it was the most dominating pitching performance ever. It was a pro throwing against guys who looked like they were in high school. Gibson often made the very best feel impotent. He intimidated you, he frustrated you, and he usually beat you. Today, Hall of Famer Bob Gibson, on pitching with passion, his aspirations both in and out of the game, and the memories, there were lots of them today on Sportsbook, it's a pleasure to have you on the show because uh, you haven't really done a lot of this long-winded, one-on-one type interviews for TV. Occasionally, maybe coming out of the woodwork more. Why have you stayed away, would you say? Well, I don't know that I've stayed away as much as uh, most of the time when people want to interview you. Is, it's about something that has happened uh, you know, at the present. And uh, they don't really care what the person is all about. Uh, they don't have time to talk about it. Mm. We're going to talk about something that's apparent at the present, an issue that's ongoing, and it's been an issue for 30, 40, 50 years. I and mean, you take a look at the big picture, I guess 100 years in baseball, and that's equality. Before we get into what you said 20 years ago about the issue of equality, I want to talk about a contemporary uh, development with the Cardinals. Apparently, it's been reported by Sports Illustrated, you had requested to be at least considered for the job at Louisville, the AAA Farm Club, at the beginning of the season, before the Campanus incident, and you were turned down by Dal Maxville. Is that true? No, that is not true. Okay. Um, I don't know where they found out all about this, but this was several years ago. Um, as a matter of fact, the, the, um, the general manager of the Louisville Ball Club had wanted to hire me, and I'm not, I don't think he was in Louisville, maybe. Maybe it was uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I'm not sure. A. Ray Smith, and uh, I guess it was Louisville, he offered me the job, and I accepted. But he had to get the okay from, uh, from the Cardinal organization, but this was uh, long before Dow Maxville. Hmm. You said of the issue of equality, developing uh, you know, talent in minority areas, as far back as 1968 in the book Ghetto to Glory. This following quote, which I think it bears repeating even today, in a world filled with hate, prejudice, and protest, I find that I, too, am filled with hate, prejudice, and protest. I hate phonies. I am prejudiced against all those who have contempt for me because my face is black and all those who accept me only because of my ability to throw a baseball. I am not proud of that ability because it's not something I earned or acquired or bought. It is a gift. It's something that was given to me, just like the color of my skin. I will not be satisfied, you said, until all people in all countries are treated equally, until any person, regardless of the color of his skin, can go where he pleases, eat where he pleases, work where he pleases, live where he pleases. I will not be satisfied until the fight for civil rights is won. Then and only then will there be glory. That's from the book, From Ghetto to Glory. It's prophetic 
And it works even today, huh? Um, I don't even remember saying that. That's profound. <laughs> <laughs> Has it changed that much since 1968? Um, things have changed. I, I really believe things have changed. Uh, but as you see them change, you, you really see them reverting back to the way they used to be. I think the people's ideas about life and about uh, a person's rights are, have changed a little bit. But uh, in the process, it is, most people are so busy and so concerned about protecting themselves that we really haven't gone any further. Mm -hmm. This week alone, some developments in baseball for minorities. Calvin Hill, ironically a football player, named to the executive board of the Baltimore Orioles. Hal McRae, named as a coach. Both black men, of course, uh, coach for the Kansas City Royals. Um, a lot of people say that those moves may not have been made had it not been for a Campanus faux pas or incident early in the year. Do you agree? Well, I don't know that you can say that it wouldn't have happened or that it did happen because, uh, as far as being a coach is concerned, I don't think that that was the reason because there are plenty of coaches that, uh, that, are taking, uh, that have gotten jobs regardless of what Campanus said. Mm -hmm. uh, I do happen to believe that uh, Calvin Hill may have been a product of uh, what Campanus has said. And uh, I think Campanus should get an award because he brought to light something that had been thought for years. Nobody ever said anything about it. And, it, and as far as baseball is concerned, it was known that this is nothing new. Mm -hmm. But he brought it out, and um, now the press gets a hold of it, and then the public gets a hold of it, and, uh, and there it is. Mm. Bill Robinson and I were speaking this past weekend. You know, there's talk now of bringing Al Campanis back in some way, um, not banishing him from the game. Harry Edwards initiated that talk recently, saying he's very valuable in the area of Latin American affairs in terms of baseball. Should baseball turn its back on Al Campanis? Well, you know, if, if you turn your back on Al Campanis because of what he said, then that's really no different than what they've been doing to us. That's mm -hmm. why I look at it. Let's move on and talk about uh, another development in baseball, and that's the issue of the brushback. Joe Torre, your best friend, one of your best friends in life, recently on our show, talking about how the pitcher has been denied in terms of uh, his territory. Here's what Joe Torre said about the brushback. The pitcher should be able to protect his, his players. I mean, if somebody gets knocked down, he should be able to retaliate. Again, I don't like throwing in that area, up around the face. But uh, baseball... Uh, I think got like this when they tried to overprotect the hitter to the point of don't you throw inside next time you throw inside I'm going to throw you out of a game and I was involved in the ball game where a pitcher threw in here and the umpire threw him out and now you can't have a pitcher just avoid throwing inside in fear that he's going to be thrown out of the ball game you can't take that away from him mm -hmm. you threw through inside you were a very intimidating pitcher and you have very pointed opinions regarding the pitcher's rights right well, yeah, I, uh, to tell me that I can't throw inside is, is pretty much taking my livelihood away from me. The, the only way I can be effective outside is to throw inside. Mm -hmm. Because you and I both know that those big, strong hitters like to get their arms out and they like to reach out over the plate and hit that ball out away from them. There are 17 inches of plate, and you contend that six or seven inches of that plate have been systematically taken away from the pitcher over the years. Well, I, don't, I can't really say how much. Um, I, I really don't think six or seven inches have been taken away. Not going uh, from the inside to the outside, going up and down, yes, more mm -hmm. than that. Mm -hmm. Because they used to call the strikes right under the armpit or right along the letters, and now it's a little bit above the, le uh, the navel. And mm -hmm. we are talking six, seven, eight inches. Going in and out, I don't know that they've taken that much. Uh, we used to get the corner of the plate, the black. You know, pitchers always talking about throwing on the black, which really wasn't a part of the plate. But a good umpire would call strikes if you were there all the time. You don't get that at all now. The irony about all of this is, and we're going to move around and talk about your life in and out of baseball, that we could have been talking about different kind of measurements because you could have been playing basketball uh, had it not been for a turn of fate in the St. Louis Cardinals. In fact, as we said before, you played with the Harlem Globetrotters briefly, played with Creighton University, met Alark Lemon many, many years ago on our show talking about Bob Gibson as a Globetrotter. Interesting to what he had to say. Here's Meadowlark. I thought Bob could have played with any team in the league today. I think he could have jumped with, he was, he could fly. And uh, uh, he had a good jump shot. He was strong and he could run with the best. Bob came in, we first met him when he played against us on the All-Star Tour. And he was just going around everybody. We, you know, we thought our feet were, were 
nailed to the floor. He was going around so fast. We'd never seen him before. And he made one mistake. He drove around Andy Johnson, and Andy told him, boy, don't do that again. <laughs> That's true, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I drove around him and made a layup, and he was kind of standing still. The next time I came through, he put his elbow up and caught me right in the neck. <laughs> and then that's when he said, don't you ever come around here again. How might it have been different for you in your life if you were a basketball player instead of a baseball player? Well, I, I think financially it would have been devastating because the Globetrotters back in those days did not pay the players. Not that I got paid that much uh, in baseball, but you did have... Uh, a where several years you're going to make some better money. And that basketball, I don't believe that those guys really got a shot at making good money until, you know, maybe like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, and we're talking 20-some years ago when I played. When you played for the Cardinals, it was slow at the beginning. Um, Johnny Keene was your manager early on. In fact, he may have been your best friend in baseball in terms of management uh, figures. You go to the Cardinals, as we said before, you develop into a tremendous pitcher. They said that you, your pitching reflected your mood, uh, all of the inequities that you suffered as a kid, the fact that you were fatherless, that you grew up in poverty. You pitched angry. Is that true? Uh, I don't know. I've, I've heard that a lot of times, and I never looked at it. I, I guess it's what other people saw. I, I don't think I was angry. I didn't particularly care for the guy on the other team. He was the enemy. And is I, it true that in an all-star game, you wouldn't even necessarily talk to any of your teammates on the all-star team? You weren't particularly, you know, not even really cordial once a game began on your own team. In other words, you were so focused on what was going on in the game, you didn't have time for small talk. Well, I wasn't particularly fond of guys on the other ball club, and, and the mere fact that we were together at an all-star game didn't make a big difference to me. And the reason I felt that way was because these guys, two days later, they're going to be trying to beat my brains out. Mm -hmm. And I always felt, and I still feel today, when people don't know anything about you, they have a tendency to fear you. And so I didn't get very close to guys on the All-Star game, during the All-Star game. Think that hurt you later on? No. I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Bob Gibson, 17 seasons, 3,117 strikeouts. In fact, the first pitcher since Walter Johnson with over 3,000 strikeouts, lifetime, our guest on Sports Living. One thing to remember as well, in 1968, he had a 1.12 ERA. That was the lowest ever in the National League with 300 innings pitched. Bob Gibson back after this. He's in Southern California this week promoting the equitable old-timers classic to be played in San Diego this weekend. Uh, which uh, benefits uh, some of the ball players who well, kind of hit hard times. Bob Gibson, the Hall of Famer, our guest on Sports Look, two-time Cy Young Award winner, MVP in both the World Series and regular season. Let's go back to the 1964 World Series. Johnny Keene, who's no longer with us, said something that really touched you. Maybe the, the best thing you said, anyone ever said, for you on your behalf. The reason he didn't take you out of uh, the World Series in 1964 when you were tiring, he, he would later tell the press, is, quote, I was committed to Bob Gibson's heart. That meant a lot to you, didn't it? Well, yeah. I, you know, it depends on how you interpret it. And people were asking me what he meant. And I said, well, you have to ask him what he meant. But I, I think I knew what he was talking about. A, um, it was something that I always wanted to do, was to be in the World Series. And there was no way I wanted to come out of a ball game like that. Yeah. 1968, you struck out 17 Detroit Tigers. Willie Horton was number 16 at that time, was a record. Willie was on our show. He talked about what that experience was like facing Bob Gibson. Here's Willie Horton. I know he'd been pitching a, one of the best games I've ever been involved in in my career. There's the pitch right there. And, man, he came at you hard. And that particular ball, I couldn't argue with the umpire because I didn't know where I didn't see it all. It <laughs> just came right at me. But a new record, 16 strikeouts in, the, in that World Series. I, I tell you, you had to take your hat off to him that game. He was just untouchable. Best best pitcher you ever faced? Best pitcher at that. I think the best pitcher in a competition, the World Series I ever faced. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I never he was in the National League, but if uh, if if I had to choose one particular pitcher, that's the best I faced coming at you at all time with hard stuff. Mike Shannon said it was not only the best performance, but the most dominant performance in baseball history by a pitcher. That game. 
Well, I don't, I don't know about that. Uh, I, I would hate to have to go out and face myself on that particular day. But, you know, I think during the World Series and, and special events like the All-Star Game, you, you have adva an advantage because you don't see those guys. And uh, especially, I, I always talk about scouting reports. I laugh about scouting reports because I think they work in your favor more than anything else. They're trying to uh, apprise the, the opposition of what you have and what you're all about. And, and I think in most of those reports, they have Bob Gibson throwing fastballs 95, 96 miles an hour, which is great because most of the time when I was effective, it was with my breaking ball. Hmm. Tim McCarver was almost awed by you when you were at your very best. Interesting quote Tim McCarver said about you when he would uh, try to talk to you going out to the mound. Here's what Tim said directly. He said, Hoot showed me things as an athlete that I probably will never see again. He works hard at everything. He's got a competitive fire that's unbelievable. Sometimes I would go out to the mound to talk to Bob Gibson. He would be concentrating so much that he would just keep turning his head. And I'd have to circle around him and say things like, Hey, I'm McCarver, the catcher. Remember me? <laughs> We've met several times before. Uh, Bob, Bob. One time I went out to the mound, and he asked me what I was doing there. I told him what I wanted to tell him. And he said, okay, Timmy, do me a favor. You go right back there and catch now. And by the way, Timmy, the only thing you really know about pitching is that you can't hit pitching. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been a nice relationship the two of you had. Oh, yeah, but you know, what Tim didn't say is that uh, most of the time when I had those types of conversation with him, it was, uh, I was joshing him more than anything oh, else. Sure, sure. Tim would say, Bob, he would come out and remind me there's a guy on first, right? Give him a chance to throw him out. And I would say, Tim, I know there's a man on first. I put him on there. <laughs> I said, as far as you're throwing him out, you're not going to throw him out anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> And, the uh, Moon Man. Um, the Moon Man was Mike Shannon, right? And yeah. He's a uh, Cardinal broadcaster these days. Um, he said that the only time he had to really pay attention in the game was when there was a runner at first base, because you'd say, Shannon, be aware for the double play. Otherwise, I don't need you, right? Yeah, he, uh, he came in from right field, and he said, Bob, you have to help me a little bit, because I don't know that much about playing third base. So uh, if you see me playing in the wrong place, move me. I said, don't worry about it. The only time you're ever going to get a ball is in a double play situation. In that one particular game, I told him that, and we had a double play situation. Uh, I turned and looked at him. He nodded his head. The guy hit the ball to him, a double play. And then when we came in, he says, how do you know you're going <laughs> to hit that ball to me? I said, Tim, I said, uh, Mike is just being smart. That's, That's all. right. <laughs> you lost two teammates to cancer, Roger Maris and Ken Boyer. I know you were close to Ken Boyer. Roger Maris more recently, of course. Um, I once asked Red Barber about that, about the Dodgers being cursed or something that sometimes media people bring up. He says, hey, it's life. That's all it is. It's life. But I wonder if you can reflect on those two losses. Well, uh, Ken Boyer was, uh, was probably a lot closer to me than, than Roger because Roger was just there two years. And, mm -hmm. of course, i, I got to say this, in the two years, I don't think I've met a nicer person. I heard all of this stuff about him being from the, the Yankees and how a rotten person he was and... It was, it, there was no truth to it whatsoever. One of the nicest individuals I ever met. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess it's because of being in New York, all the press, that you, you have a tendency to want to stay away from people. And like I said earlier, if they don't know anything about you, they're going to make up all these stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken Boyer was, uh, we call him the captain. And uh, it had more to do with just being the captain of the ball club. He was, he was kind of a leader, uh, not only at the park, but... Uh, off, uh, uh, when we would leave and, and go away from the park, and we'd go out in restaurants, and we'd go to bars, and we'd go... He, he was just kind of a take-charge guy. And uh, I think what he was to most of us was like, like a big brother. Hmm. And uh, I guess that's why we called him a captain, and I always have fond memories of him. There were nice moments, too, for the Cardinals after the acquisition of Orlando Chacha Cepeda. Your thoughts on Chacha? Chacha was a team leader, and he didn't even know it. <laughs> he had no idea. Uh, when we would win ball games, especially in 67, he would get up on the box after the game, uh, the money box, and he would le lead cheers. Oh, yeah. Alberto, what, Bertos? Hey, Bertos, let's go. And even when we lost the ball game, he would stand up there, and guys would come in kind of feeling a little bad, and he would say, are we going to come back tomorrow, or are we going to stay home? And guys said, we'll be back tomorrow. Yeah. And that was the type of thing that he did. you got to hear this quote that we're going to give you from Kurt Flood because it's so ironic. Here's a guy that led the way for free agency saying the ball player of today is a bit overpaid. Kurt Flood on the salaries, the escalating salaries for Major League Baseball players today. Here it is. 
the, the pendulum has swung, you know, and, and um, I'm, a, I'm a baseball person. I've been in baseball all of my life, ever since I was a very small child. And it, it, it breaks my heart that when I first started with Cincinnati, we had 25 minor league teams. Now they have two. Hmm. What, does, what does that tell you? Where are we going? Uh, uh, all of the money that, in theory, would have gone into lower ticket prices, lower hot dogs, uh, is going into the bank account of some, some baseball player that may play one or two years, and then he, he, he takes it and goes, goes to Spain, right? <laughs> it's a bit <laughs> ironic to hear him say it that way. Yeah, because he's the reason why they get to do that today. Right, right, right. Uh, Kurt wasn't doing that for anybody else. He was doing it for himself. He didn't want to be traded. And it had nothing to do with wanting to, to get a million dollars a year because he wasn't asking for a bunch of money. He just did not want to leave St. Louis and go somewhere else. Mm. Bob Gibson's our guest on Sports. We'll come back after this. life after baseball. He's 52 now, by the way, and uh, the sec 53? One. 51 going to be 52. No, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the new joy in Bob Gibson's life is Robert Christopher Gibson. This little boy knocks you out. Just happened to have had a picture, huh? Yeah, I, I used to carry 10 or 12. <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to have an awful lot of problems at my age with a kid. You know, I don't want to go through all of this, but he's been, he's been the most fun in my life. How's he changed it? The life? Well, uh, he's uh, made me a lot softer. You know, you talk about this mean person that everybody knows, and, and he just uh, he makes me melt uh, just coming close to him. And uh, just to watch him grow up and uh, see him learn things is just really wonderful. Yeah. This is going to be a short break. We're going to come back and wrap things up with Bob Gibson right after this. Guests on Sports Look receive compact binoculars from Bosch & Lahm, one of the first names in sports optics. Waterproof, fog-proof, and center focus, they get you close to the action. Furnished by Bushnell. A lot of great things in Bob Gibson's life. He's known a lot of triumph and a lot of sadness as well. As we said before, growing up fatherless in poverty, Omaha, Nebraska, he once said that had he not visited the inmates of the penitentiary as a star baseball player, he came to the realization that had it not been for his talents, he might have been in that penitentiary. We have about a minute left. How, in fact, will our society in general change for the better in your mind? Will it ever really change for the better in terms of inequity? Well, you know, I hate to say this, and I hope I'm wrong, but I really don't think it's going to change that much. I think people are, are, are learning to be a little bit more sophisticated in their bigotry. And mm. I don't think that you're going to see people walking out calling names like they did 50 years ago. But uh, the way you can control it is uh, financially. And, and when you see blacks at the top of AT&T, then it's going to change. Mm. Representing Equitable and the Equitable Old Timers Classic, which is certainly a beneficial program, is San Diego this week and benefiting old ball players. Bob Gibson, who's not really an old ball player, joining us today on Sports like Bob, it was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you. We'll come back to you about tomorrow's show. Actually, Monday's show after this. We're preempted on Friday on ESPN, but Monday, Harry Carey's back, and he's with us on Sportsnet. Have a good weekend, everybody. We'll see you Monday. Sportsnet has been brought to you by Mazda and its new generation RX-7, the World Class 626, the Fun to Drive 323, and the full line of Mazda trucks. The more you look, the more you like Mazda value.